Solomon Kane started up in the darkness, snatching at the weapons which lay on the pile of skins that served them as a crude pallet. It was not the mad drum of the tropic rain on the leaves of the hut roof which had wakened him, nor the bellowing of the thunder. It was the screams of human agony, the clash of steel that cut through the din of the tropical storm. Some sort of conflict was taking place in the native village in which he had sought refuge from the storm, and it sounded much like a raid on force. As Solomon groped for his sword, he wondered what bushman would raid a village in the night and in such a storm as this. His pistols lay beside his sword, but he did not take them up, knowing that they would be useless in such a torrent of rain a rain which would whet their priming instantly. He had laid down fully clad, save for his slouch hat and cloak, and without stopping for them, he ran to the door of the hut. A ragged streak of lightning, which seemed to rip the sky open, showed him a chaotic glimpse of the struggling figures in the spaces between the huts, dazzlingly glinting back from the flashing steel. Above the storm, he heard the shrieks of the black people and deep-toned shouts in a language unfamiliar to him. Springing from the hut, he sensed the presence of one in front of him. Then another thunderous burst of fire ripped across the sky, limning all in a weird blue light. In that flashing instant, Solomon thrust savagely, felt the blade bend double in his hand, and saw a heavy sword swinging for his head. A burst of sparks, brighter than the lightning, exploded before his eyes. Then blackness, darker than the jungle night, engulfed him. Dawn was spreading pallidly over the dripping jungle reaches when Solomon Kane stirred and sat up in the ooze before the hut. Blood had caked on his scalp and his head ached slightly. Shaking off a slight grogginess, he rose. The rain had long since ceased. The skies were clear. Silence lay over the village. And Cain saw that it was, in truth, a village of the dead. Corpses of men, women and children lay strewn everywhere. In the streets, in the doorways of the huts, inside the huts, some of which had been literally ripped to pieces, either in search of cowering victims or in sheer wantonness of destruction. They had not taken many prisoners, Solomon decided, whoever the unknown raiders might be. Nor had they taken the spears, axes, cooking pots, and plumed headpieces of their victims. This fact seemed to argue a raid by a race superior in culture an artisanship to the crude villagers. But they had taken all the ivory they could find, and they had taken, Cain discovered, his rapier and his dirk, pistols and powder and shot pouches. And they had taken his staff, the sharp-pointed, strangely carved, cat-headed stave, which his friend, Nolonga, the West Coast Witchman, had given him, as well as his hat and cloak. Cain stood in the center of the desolated village, brooding over the matter, strange speculations running at random through his mind. His conversation with the natives of the village, into which he had made his way the night before out of the storm-beaten jungle, gave him no clue as to the nature of the raiders. The natives themselves had known little about the land into which they had but recently come driven over a long trek by a rival, more powerful tribe. They had been a simple, good-natured people who had welcomed him into their huts and given him freely of their humble goods. Cain's heart was hot with wrath against their unknown destroyers, but even deeper than that, burned his unquenchable curiosity. The Curse of the Intelligent Man For Cain had looked on mystery in the night, and the storm, that vivid flame of lightning, had shown him, etched momentarily in its glare, a fierce black-bearded race. The face of a white man. Yet according to sanity, there could be no white men, 
not even Arab raiders, within hundreds and hundreds of miles. Kane had had no time to observe the man's dress, but he had a vague impression that the figure was clad bizarrely. And that sword, which, striking glancing and flat, had struck him down, surely that had been no crude native weapon. Kane glanced at the crude mud wall which surrounded the village, at the bamboo gates which now lay in ruins, hewn to pieces by the raiders. The storm had apparently abated when the raiders marched forth, for he made out a broad trampled track leading out of the broken gate and into the jungle. Kane picked up a crude native axe that lay nearby. If any of the unknown slayers had fallen in the battle, their bodies had been carried away by their companions. Leaves pieced together made him a makeshift hat to protect his head from the force of the sun. Then Solomon Kane went through the broken gate and into the dripping jungle, following the spore of the unknown. Under the giant trees, the tracks became clearer, and Kane made out that most of them were a type of sandal. Likewise, that was strange to him. The remaining tracks were of bare feet, indicating that some prisoners had been taken. Apparently, they had a long start, for though he traveled without pause, swinging along tirelessly on his rangy legs, he did not sight the column in that day's march. He ate of the food he had brought from the ruined village and pressed on without halting, consumed by anger, when with the desire to solve the mystery of that lightning-limbed face. More, the raiders had taken his weapons, and in that dark land, a man's weapons were his life. The day wore on. As the sun sank, the jungle gave way to the forest land, and at twilight, Cain came out on a rolling, grass-grown, tree-dotted plain, and saw far across it what appeared to be a low-lying grange of hills. The tracks led straight out across the plain, and Cain believed the raider's goal was those low, even hills. He hesitated. Across the grasslands came the thunderous roaring of lions, echoing and re-echoing from a score of different points. The great cats were beginning to stalk their prey, and it would be suicide to venture across that vast open space armed with only an axe. Cain found a giant tree and clambered into it, settled himself in a crotch as comfortably as he might. Far out across the plain, he saw a point of light twinkling among the hills. Then on the plain, approaching the hills, he saw other lights, a twinkling fire set serpentine line that moved toward the hills, now scarcely visible against the stars along the horizon. It was the column of raiders with their captives, he realized. They were bearing torches and traveling swiftly. The torches were no doubt to keep off the lion, and Cain decided that their goal must be very near at hand if they risked a night march on those carnivore-haunted grasslands. As he watched, he saw the twinkling fire points move upward, and for a while they glittered among the hills. Then he saw them no more. Speculating on the mystery of it all, Cain slept, while the night winds whispered dark secrets of ancient Africa among the leaves, and lions roared beneath his tree lashing their tufted tails as they gazed upward with hungry eyes. Again, dawn lighted the land with rose and gold, and Solomon descended from his perch and took up his journey. He ate the last of the food he had brought, drank from a stream that looked fairly pure, and speculated on the chance of finding food among the hills. If he did not find it, he might be in a precarious position but Cain had been hungry before, aye, and starving, and freezing, and weary. His rangy, broad-shouldered frame was hard as iron, pliant as steel. So he swung boldly out across the savannas, watching warily for lurking lions, but slackening not his pace, 
The sun climbed to the zenith and dipped westward. As he approached the low range, he began to grow in distinctness. He saw that instead of rugged hills, he was approaching a low plateau that rose abruptly from the surrounding plain and appeared to be level. He saw trees and tall grass on the edges, but the cliffs seemed barren and rough. However, they were at no point more than 70 or 80 feet in height, as far as he could see, and he anticipated no great difficulty in surmounting them. Approaching them, he saw that they were almost solid rock, though overlaid by a fairly thick stratum of soil. Boulders had tumbled down in many places, and he saw that an active man could scale the cliffs in many places, but he saw something else. A broad road which wound up the steep pitch of the precipice, and up which led the spoors he was following. Cain approached the road, noting the excellence of the road's workmanship. Certainly no mere animal path, or even a native trail. The road had been cut into the cliff with consummate skill, and it was paved and palustrated with smoothly cut blocks of stone. Wary as a wolf, he avoided the road. Further on, he found a less steep slope up which he went. It was unstable footing, and boulders that seemed to poise on the slope threatened to roll down upon him, but he accomplished the task without undue hazard and came out over the edge of the cliff. Cain stood on a rugged, boulder-strewn slope, which pitched off rather steeply on a flat expanse. From where he stood, he saw the broad plateau spread out beneath his feet, carpeted with lush green grass. And in the midst, he blinked his eyes and shook his head, thinking he looked on some mirage or hallucination. No, it was still there, a massive walled city rearing from the grassy plain. He saw the battlements, the towers beyond, with small figures moving about them. On the other side of the city, he made out a small lake, on the shores of which stretched luxuriant gardens and fields, and meadow-like expanses filled with grazing cattle. Amazement at the sight held the Puritan frozen for an instant. Then the clink of an iron heel on a stone brought him quickly about to face the man who had come from among the boulders. This man was broad-built and powerful, almost as tall as Cain, and heavier. His bare arms bulged with muscles, and his legs were like knotted iron pillars. His face was a duplicate of that Cain had seen in the lightning flash. Fierce, black-bearded, the face of a white man with arrogant eyes, and a predatory, hooked nose. From his bull throat to his knees, he was clad in a corselet of iron scales, and on his head was an iron helmet. A metal brace shield of hardwood and leather was on his left arm, a dagger in his girdle, and a short but heavy iron mace in his band. All this, Cain saw in a glance as the man roared and leaped. The Englishman realized that in that moment there was to be no such thing as a parley. It was to be a battle to the death. As a tiger leaps, he sprang to meet the warrior, launching his axe with all the power of that rangy frame. The warrior caught the blow in his shield. The axe edge turned, the half splintering in Cain's hand, the buckler shattered. Carried by the momentum of his savage lunge, Cain's body crashed against his foe, who dropped the useless shield and staggering, grappled with the Englishman. Straining and grasping, they reeled on hard, on hard braced feet, and Cain snarled like a wolf as he felt the full power of his foe's strength. The armor hampered the Englishman, and the warrior had shortened his grasp on the iron mace and was ferociously striving to crash it on Cain's bare head. The Englishman was striving to pinion the warrior's arm, but his clutching fingers missed, and the mace crashed sickeningly against his bare head. Again it fell, as a fire-shot mist clouded Cain's vision, but his instinctive wrench avoided it, though it half numbed his shoulder ripping the skin so that the blood started in streams. 
Madden Kane lunged fiercely against the stalwart body of the mace wielder, and one blindly grasping hand closed on the dagger hilt at the warrior's girdle. Ripping it forth, he stabbed blindly and savagely. Close locked, the fighters staggered backward, the one stabbing in venomous silence, the other striving to tear his arm free so that he might crash home one destroying blow. The warrior's short, half-hindered blows glanced from Kane's head and shoulders, lacerating the skin and bringing blood in streams. Red lances of agony pierced the Englishman's clouding brain, and still the dagger in his lunging hand glanced from the iron scales that guarded his foe's body. Blinded, dazed, fighting on instinct alone as a wounded wolf fights, Kane's teeth snapped, fang-like, into the great bullthroat of his foe. The torn flesh and a burst of flooding blood brought an agonized roar from the powerful frame. The lashing mace faltered and the warrior flinched back. They reeled on the edge of a low precipice and pitched, rolling headlong and close clinched. At the foot of the slope they brought up and Kane uppermost. The dagger in his hand glittered high above his head and flashed downward, sinking hilt deep in the warrior's throat. Kane's body pitched forward. With a blow, and he lay, senseless above his slain enemy. They lay in a widening pool of blood. In the sky, specks appeared, black against the blue, wheeling, circling, and dropping lower. Then, from among the defiles, appeared men, similar in apparel and appearance to he who lay dead beneath Cain's senseless body. They had been attracted by the sounds of a battle. And now they stood about, discussing the matter in harsh and guttural tones. Slaves stood a little away from them, in complete silence. They dragged the forms apart and discovered that one was dead, and one probably dying. Then, after some discussion, they made a litter of their spears and sword slings, and ordered their slaves to lift the bodies and carry them. The party set out toward the city, which gleamed strangely in the midst of the grassy plain. Chapter 2 Consciousness returned to Solomon Kane. He was lying on a couch covered with finely dressed skins and furs in a large chamber, whose floor, walls, and ceiling were of stone. There was one window heavily barred, and a single doorway. Outside stood a stalwart warrior, in appearance much like the man he had slain. Then Cain discovered another thing. Golden chains were on his wrists, neck, and ankles. They were linked together in an intricate pattern, and were made fast to a ring set in the wall with a strong silver lock. Cain found that his wounds had been bandaged, and as he pondered over his situation, a slave entered with food and a kind of purple wine. The Englishman made no attempt at conversation, but ate the food offered and drank deeply. The wine was drugged, and he soon fell asleep. Many hours later, when he awakened, he found that the bandages had been changed. This time, when he awakened, he felt strong and refreshed. A different guard stood outside the door, a man of the same caste as the former soldier, however, muscular, black-bearded and clad in armor. Cain quickly decided that when the slave returned, he would seek to learn something of the curious environs into which he had fallen. The scruff of leather sandals on the tilings announced the approach of someone, and Cain sat up on his couch as a group of figures entered the chamber. In the background lurked the slave who had brought Cain's food. Before him, a group of men had assembled in a little clump, robed, inscrutable, shaven of face and head, and a little apart from them stood a man whose figure dominated the whole scene. He was tall, with garments of silk bound by a golden-scaled girdle. His blue-black hair and beard were curiously curled, his hawk-nosed face cruel and predatory. The arrogance of the eyes, which Cain had noticed as characteristic of the unknown race, much more evident than in the others. 
On his head was a curiously carved circlet of gold, in his hand a golden wand. The attitude of the rest toward him was one of cringing servility, and Cain believed that he looked upon either the king or the high priest of the city. Beside this personage stood a shorter, fatter man, with shaven face and head, clad in robes much like those worn by the lesser persons in the background, but far more costly. In his hand he bore a scourge composed of six thongs made fast to a jewel-set handle. The thongs ended in triangular-shaped bits of metal, and the whole represented as savage as implement of punishment as Cain had ever looked upon. The man who bore this had small eyes, shifty and crafty and his whole attitude was a mixture of fawning servility toward the man with the scepter and of intolerant despotism toward the lesser beings. King gave back their stare, trying to place an elusive sense of familiarity. There was something in the features of these people which vaguely suggested the Arab, yet they were strangely unlike any Arabs he had ever seen. They spoke together, and their language at times had a somewhat had a somehow familiar sound, but he could not define these faint stirrings of half-memory. At last, the tall man with the scepter turned and strode majestically forth, followed by his slavish companions. Cain was left alone. After a time, the fat second-in-command returned with half a dozen soldiers and acolytes. Among these was the young slave who brought Cain's food and a tall and somber figure, naked but for a loincloth, who bore a great key at his girdle. The soldiers ringed Cain, javelins ready, while this man unlocked the chains from the ring in the wall. They surrounded him and, holding to his chains, indicated that he was to march with them. Surrounded by his captors, Cain emerged from the chamber into what appeared to be a series of wide galleries winding about the interior of the vast structure. Tier by tier, and turned at last into a chamber much like that he had left, similarly furnished. Cain's chains were made fast to a ring in the stone wall near the single window. He could stand upright, or lie, or sit on the skin-piled couch, but he could not move half a dozen steps in any direction. Wine and food was placed at his disposal. His captors left them, and Cain noticed that neither was the door bolted nor a guard placed before it. He decided that they considered his chain sufficient to keep him safe, and after testing them, and after testing them he realized that they were right. Yet there was another reason for their apparent carelessness, as he was to learn. The Englishman looked out of the window, which was larger than the other had been and not so thickly barred. He was looking out over the city from a considerable height. Below him were narrow streets, broad avenues flanked by what seemed to be columns and carven stone lions and on wide expanses of flat-roofed houses. Many of the buildings were of stone, and others were of a sun-dried brick. There was a massiveness about this architecture that was vaguely repellent, a somber, heavy motif that seemed to suggest a sullen and slightly inhuman character of the builders. A wall that surrounded the city was tall and thick, with towers spaced at regular intervals. He saw armored figures moving sentinel-like along the wall and mediated upon the warlike aspect of this people. The streets and marketplaces below him offered a colorful maze as the richly clad people moved in an ever-shifting panorama. As for the building which was his prison, Cain could make out little of its nature. Yet, below him, he saw a series of massive tiers descending like giant stair steps. It must be, he decided with a rather 
unpleasant sensation, built much like the fabled Tower of Babel, one tier above another. Cain turned his attention back to his chamber. The walls were rich in mural decorations, carvings painted in various colors, well tinted and blended. Indeed, the art was as high a standard as any the Englishman had ever seen in Asia or in Europe. Most of the scenes were of war or of the hunt, powerful men with black beards that were often curled in armor, slaying lions and driving other warriors before them. Some of the pursued warriors were naked black men. Others closely resembled their pursuers. The human figures were not as well depicted as those of the beasts. They were conventionalized to a point that often lent them a somewhat wooden aspect. But the lions were portrayed with vivid realism. Some of the scenes showed the black-bearded slayers in chariots drawn by fire, breathing steeds. And Cain felt again that strange sense of familiarity. As if he had seen these scenes or similar scenes before. The chariots and horses, he noted, were inferior in life likeness to the lions. The fault was not in conventionalizing, but in the artist's ignorance of his subject, Kane decided, noting mistakes that seemed incongruous considering the skill with which they were portrayed. Time passed swiftly as he pondered over the carvings. Presently, the silent slave entered with food and wine. When he sat down, the viands. Cain spoke to him in a dialect of the Bush tribes, to one of the divisions of which he believed the man belonged, having noted certain tribal scars on his features. The dull face lighted slightly, and the man answered in a tongue similar enough for Cain to understand him. What city is this? Ninwana. Who are these people? The dull slave shook his head in doubt. They be very old people, Buana. They have dwelt here a very long time. Was that their king who came to my chamber with his men? Yes, Buana. That be King Ashura Ras Harab. And the man with the lash? Yaman, the priest, Buana Poison. Why do you call me that? Asked Cain, nonplussed. So the masters name you Buana. The slave shrank back and his skin turned ashy as the shadow of a tall figure fell across the doorway. A shaven-headed, half-naked giant entered and the slave fell to his knees, wailing his terror. Mighty fingers closed about the terrified throat, and Cain saw the wretched slave's eyes protruding, his tongue thrust from his gaping mouth. His body writhed and thrashed unavailingly, hands clawed weakly and more weakly at iron wrists. Then he went limp in his slayer's hands. As the shaven-headed warrior released him, the corpse slumped loosely to the floor. The warrior smote his hands together, and a pair of slaves entered. Their faces turned ashy at the sight of their companion's corpse, but at a gesture they callously laid hold of the dead man's feet and dragged him form. The warrior turned at the door and his opaque and implacable eyes met Cain's gaze, as if in warning. Hate drummed in Cain's temples, and it was the grim eyes of the murderer which fell before the cold fury in the Englishman's glare. The man went noiselessly forth leaving Cain to his meditations. When food was next brought to Cain, 
It was carried by a rangy young slave of genial and intelligent appearance. Cain made no effort to speak to him. Apparently, the masters did not wish for their captive to learn anything about them for some reason or another. How many days Cain remained in the high-flung chamber, he did not know. Each day was exactly like the last, and he lost count of time. Sometimes, Yaman the priest came and looked upon him with a satisfied air that made Cain's eyes turn red with a killer's lust. Sometimes, the giant murderer noiselessly appeared to disappear just as noiselessly. Cain's eyes were riveted to the key that swung from the silent giant's girdle. Could he but once get within reach of the fellow? But his captor was careful to stay out of reach unless Cain was surrounded by warriors with ready javelins. Then, one night, to his chamber came Yaman the priest, with the silent giant who was called Siem and some fifty acolytes and soldiers. It was Siem who unlocked Cain's chains from the wall, and between two columns of soldiers and priests, the Englishman was escorted along the winding galleries that were lighted by flaring torches set in the niches along the walls and borne in the hands of the priests. By the light, Cain again observed the carven figures marching everlastingly around the massive walls of the galleries. Many were life-sized, some dimmed and somewhat defaced as with age. Most of these, Cain noted, portrayed men in chariots drawn by horses, and he decided that the later, imperfect figures of steeds and chariots had been copied from these older carvings. Apparently, there were no horses or chariots in the city now. Various racial distinctions were evident in the human figures. The hooked noses and curled black beards of the dominant race were plainly distinguishable. Their opponents were sometimes black men, sometimes men like themselves, and occasionally tall, rangy men with unmistakable Arab features. Solomon was startled to note that in some of the older scenes, Men were depicted whose apparel and features were entirely different from those of the Ninites. These strangers were always pictured in battle scenes, and significantly came thought, not always in retreat. Frequently, they seemed to be having the best of the fight, and nowhere could the Englishmen find them portrayed as slaves. But what interested him was the familiarity those carven features were, like the countenance of a friend in a strange land to the wanderer. Apart from their strange, barbaric arms and apparel, they might have been Englishmen, with their European features and yellow locks. Somewhere in the long, long ago, Cain knew the ancestors of the men of Nian had warred with men kin to his own ancestors. But in what age and in what land? Certainly, the scenes were not laid in the country that was now the homeland of the Ninites. For these scenes showed fertile plains, grassy hills, and wide rivers, aye, and great cities like Nian but strangely unlike. And suddenly, Cain remembered where he had seen similar carvings, wearing kings with black curled beards slew lions from chariots. He had seen them on crumbling pieces of masonry that marked the site of a long forgotten city in Mesopotamia. The men had told him those ruins were all that remained of Nineveh the bloody, the accursed of God. The Englishman and his captors had reached the ground tier of the great temple, and they passed between huge columns, squat and carven like the walls. 
At length they came to a vast circular space between the massive wall and the flanking pillars. Cut from the stone of the mighty wall sat a colossal idol, carven features as devoid of human weakness and kindness as the face of a Stone Age monster. Facing the idol on a stone throne in the shadow of the pillars sat the king, Ashur Ras Harab. The firelight flickered on his strongly chiseled face so that at first, King thought it was an idol that sat on the throne. Before the god and facing the king's throne was another, smaller throne. A brazier on a golden tripod stood before it. Coals glowed in the brazier, and smoke curled languriously upward. A flowing robe of shimmering green silk was put upon Cain hiding his tattered and stained garments and the golden chains. He was motioned to sit in the throne before the brazier, and he did so without a sound. Then his ankles and wrists were locked cunningly to the throne, hidden by the folds of the silken robe. The lesser priests and the soldiers melted away, leaving only Cain, the priest Yaman, and the king upon his throne. Back in the shadows among the tree-like columns, Cain occasionally glimpsed the glint of metal-like fireflies in the dark. Warriors still lurked there, out of sight. He sensed that some sort of a stage had been set. Cain felt a suggestion of charlatanry in the whole procedure. Now, Ashur Ras Harab, lifted the golden wand and struck once upon a gong that hung near his throne. A full and mellow note like a distant chime echoed among the dim reaches of the shadowy temple. Along the dusky avenue between the columns came a group of men whom Cain realized must be the nobles of that fantastic city. There were tall men, black-bearded and haughty of bearing, clad in shimmering silk and gleaming gold, and among them walked one in golden chains, a youth whose attitude seemed a mixture of apprehension and defiance. The assemblage knelt before the king, bowing their heads to the floor. At a word from him they arose and faced the Englishman and the god behind him. Now Yaman, with the firelight glinting on his shaven head and into his evil eyes so that he looked like a paunchy demon, cried out a sort of weird chant and flung a handful of powder into the brazier. Instantly, a greenish smoke billowed upward, half veiling Cain's face. The Englishman gagged. The smell and taste were unpleasant in the extreme. He felt groggy, drugged. His brain reeled like a drunken man's, and he tore savagely at his chains. Only half conscious of what he said, unaccustomed oaths ripped from his lips. He was dimly aware that Yaman cried out fiercely at his curses, the priest leaning forward in an attitude of listening. Then the powder burned out. The smoke waned away and Cain sat groggy and bewildered on the throne. Yaman turned toward the king and bent low. He straightened and, with his arms outstretched, spoke in a sonorous tone. The king solemnly repeated his words and Cain saw the face of the noble prisoner go white. Then his captors seized his arms and the band marched slowly away their footfalls coming back eerily through the shadowy vastness. Like silent ghosts, the soldiers came from the shadows and unchained him. Again, they grouped themselves about Cain and led him up and up through the dim galleries to his chamber, where again, Shem locked his chains to the wall. Cain sat on his couch, chin on his fist, striving to find some motive in all the bizarre actions he had witnessed. And presently, he realized that there was undue stir in the streets below. 
the Englishman peered out from his window. Great fires blazed in the marketplace, and the figures of men, curiously foreshortened, came and went. They seemed to be busying themselves about a figure in the center of the marketplace, but they clustered about it so thickly he could make nothing of it. A circle of soldiers ringed the group. The firelight glanced on their armor. About them clamored a disorderly mob yelling and shouting. Suddenly a scream of frightful agony cut through the din, and the shouting died away for an instant to be renewed with more force than before. Most of the clamor sounded like protest, came thought, though mingled with it was the sound of jeers, taunting howls, and devilish laughter. And all through the babel rang those ghastly, intolerable shrieks. A swift pad of naked feet sounded on the tiles, and the young slave, who was called Sula, rushed in and thrust his head into the window, panting with excitement. The firelight from without shone on his contorted face. The people strive with the spearman, he exclaimed, forgetting in his excitement the order not to converse with the strange captive. Many of the people love well the young Prince Belladarth of Puana. There was no evil in him. Why did you bid the king have him flayed alive? I... Uh, exclaimed Cain, taken aback and dumbfounded. I said naught. I do not even know this prince. I have never seen him. Sula turned his head and looked full into Cain's face. Now I know what I have secretly thought, Buana. You are no god, nor mouthpiece of a god, but a man, such as I have seen before the men of Nin took the captive. Once before, when I was small, I saw men cast in your mold, who came with their black servants and slew our warriors with weapons which spoke with fire and thunder. He said in the Bantu tongue Cain understood. Truly, I am but a man, answered Cain dazedly. But what I do not understand. What is it they do in yonder marketplace? They are skinning Prince Bellada the life, answered Sula. It has been talked freely among the marketplaces that the king and Yaman hated the prince, who is of the blood of Abdullah. But he had many followers among the people, especially among the RB, and not even the king dared sentence him to death. But when you were brought into the temple, secretly, none in the city knowing of it, Yaman said you were the mouthpiece of the gods. And he said Baal had revealed to him that Prince Baladath had roused the wrath of the gods. So they brought him before the oracle of the gods. Cain swore sickly. How incredible. How ghastly. To think that his lusty English oaths had doomed a man to a horrible death. I, crafty Yaman, had translated his random words in his own way. And so the prince, whom Cain had never seen before, writhed beneath the skinning knives of his executioners in the marketplace below, where the crowd shrieked or jeered. Shula, he said. What do these people call themselves? Assyrian Spwana, answered the slave absently, staring in horrified fascination at the grisly scene below. Chapter 3 in the days that followed, Sula found opportunities from time to time to talk with Cain. Little he could tell the Englishmen of the origin of the men of Nin. He only knew that they had come out of the east in the long, long ago, and had built their massive city on the plateau. Only the dim legends of his tribe spoke of them. 
His people lived in the rolling plains far to the south and had warred with the people of the city for untold ages. His tribe was called Tsulas, and they were strong and warlike, he said. From time to time they made raids on the Ninites, and occasionally the Ninites returned the raid, but not often did they venture far from the plateau. In such a raid, Sula had been captured. Of late, the Ninites had been forced to range further afield in search of slaves, as the tribe shunned the Grim Plateau, and generation by generation moved further back into the wilderness. The life of a slave of Nin was hard, Sula said, and Cain believed him. Seeing the marks of rack, lash, and brand on the youth's body, the drifting ages had not softened the spirit of the Assyrians, nor modified their fierceness, a byword in the ancient East. Cain wondered much at the presence of these ancient people in this forgotten land. But Sula had nothing further to tell him. They came from the East long, long ago, and that was all Sula knew. The Englishman knew now why their features and language had seemed remotely familiar. Their features were the original Semitic features, now modified in the modern inhabitants of Mesopotamia. And many of their words had a certain likeness to many Hebraic words and phrases. Cain learned from Sula that not all of the inhabitants were of one blood. They did not mix with their slaves. Or if they did, the offspring of such a union was instantly put to death. The dominant strain, Sula had learned, was Assyrian, but there were some of the people, both commoners and nobles, who were called RB. They were like the Assyrians, yet differing somewhat. Another group were the Chaldi. Magicians and soothsayers who were held in no great esteem by the true Assyrians. Shem, Sula said, and his kind were Elamites, and Cain started at the biblical term. There were not many of them. They were the tools of the priests, slayers and doers of strange and unnatural deeds. Sula had suffered at the hands of Shem, as had every other slave at the temple, and it was this same Shem who on whom Cain kept his hungry eyes riveted. At his girdle hung the golden key that meant liberty, but as if he read the meaning in the Englishman's cold eyes, Shem walked with care, a dark, somber giant with a grim, carven face. He came not within reach within the captive's long, steely arms, unless accompanied with armed guards. Nearer day passed, but Gain heard the crack of the scourge, the screams of agonized slaves beneath the brand, the lash, or the skinning knife. Neen was a veritable hell, he reflected, ruled by the demoniac Ashur Rasarab and his crafty and lustful satellite Yamin the Priest. The king was high priest as well, as had been his royal ancestors in ancient Nineveh, and Cain realized why they called him a Persian, seeing in him a resemblance to those wild old Aryan tribesmen who had ridden down from their mountains to sweep the Assyrian Empire off the earth. Surely, it was fleeing those yellow-haired conquerors that the people of Nin had come to Africa. The days passed, and Cain abode as a captive in the city of Nin, but he went no more to the temple as an oracle. One day, there was a confusion in the city. Cain heard the trumpets blaring upon the wall and the roll of kettle drums. Steel clanged in the streets, and the sound of men marching rose to his eerie. Looking out over the wall across the plateau, he saw a horde of naked black men approaching the city in loose formation, their spears flashed in the sun, their headpieces of ostrich plumes floated in the breeze, and their yells came faintly to him. Sula rushed in, his eyes blazing. My people! 
he exclaimed. They come against the men of Nin. My people are warriors. Bokaga is war chief. Katayo is king. The war chiefs of the Sulas hold their honors by the might of their hands. For any man who is strong enough to slay him with his naked hands becomes war chief in his place. So Bokaga won the chieftainship. But it will be many a day before any slays him, for he is the mightiest chieftain of them all. Kane's window afforded a better view over the wall than any other, for his chamber was in the topmost tier of Baal's temple. To his chamber came Yaman, with his grim guards, Shem, and another somber Elamite. They stood out of Kane's reach, looking through one of the windows. The mighty gate swung wide. The Assyrians were marching out to meet their enemies. Cain reckoned that there were 1,500 armed warriors. That left 300 still in the city. The bodyguard of the king, the sentries, and house troops of the various noblemen. The host, Cain noted, was divided into four divisions. The center was in the advance, consisting of 600 men, while each flank or wing was composed of 300. The remaining 300 marched in compact formation behind the center, between the wings, so the whole presented an appearance of an arrow-like figure. The warriors were armed with javelins, swords, maces, and short heavy bows. On their backs were quivers bristling with shafts. They marched out on the plain in effective order, and took up their position, apparently awaiting the attack. It was not slow in coming. Cain estimated that the blacks numbered at least 3,000 warriors, and even at that distance, he could appreciate their splendid stature and courage, but they had no system or order of warfare. In one great ragged, disorderly horde, they rushed onward, to be met by a withering blast of arrows that ripped through their bullhide shields as though they had been made of paper. The Assyrians had slung their shields about their necks and were drawing and loosing methodically, not in regular volleys as the archers of Kreshi and Agincourt had loosened, but steadily and without pause. Nevertheless, with reckless courage, the black men hurled themselves forward into the teeth of the fearful hail. Cain saw whole lines melt away, and the plain became carpeted with the dead. But the blacks hurled themselves forward, wasting their lives like water. Cain marveled at the perfect discipline of the Semitic soldiers who went through their motions as coolly as if they were on drill ground. As if they were on the drill ground. The wings had moved forward, their foremost tips connecting with the ends of the center, presenting an unbroken front. The men in the company between the wings maintained their place, unmoving, not yet having taken any part in the battle. The Black Horde was broken, staggering back under the deadly fire against which flesh and blood could not stand. The Great Ragged Crescent had broken to bits, and from the fire of the right flank in the center, the Black Men were falling back disorderly. Pounded by the ranging shafts of the Semitic warriors, but on the left flank, a frothing mob of perhaps 400 warriors had burst through the fearful barrage, and yelling like fiends, they shocked against the Assyrian wing. But before the spears clashed, Cain saw the company in reserve between the wing's wheel and march in double quick time to support the threatened wing. They shocked against the Assyrian wing. But before the spears clashed, Cain saw the company in reserve between the wing's wheel and march against that double wall of 600 mailed warmen. The onslaught staggered, broke, and reeled backward. Swords flashed among the spears, and Cain saw the naked black men falling like grain before the reaper as the javelins and swords of the Assyrians mowed them down. Not all the corpses on the bloody ground were those of black men, but where one Assyrian lay dead or wounded, ten Sulas had died. Now the black men were in full flight across the plain, and the iron ranks moved forward in quick but orderly pace, losing at every step, hunting the vanquished across the plateau, plying the dagger on the wounded. They took no prisoners. Sulas did not make good slaves, 
as Solomon was instantly to see. In Kane's chamber, the watchers were crowded at the windows, eyes glued in fascination on the wild and gory scene. Sula's chest heaved with passion, his eyes blazed with the bloodlust of the savage, as the shouts and the slaughter and the spears of his tribesmen fired all the slumbering ferocity in his savage soul. With the yell of a blood-mad panther, he sprang on the backs of his masters. Before any could lift a hand, he snatched the dagger from Shem's girdle and plunged it into the hilt between Yaman's shoulders. The priest shrieked like a wounded woman and went to his knees, blood spurting, and the Elamites, closed with the raging slave. Shem sought to seize his wrist, but the other Elamite and Sula whirled into a deadly embrace, plying their knives which were in an instant red to the hilt. Eyes glaring, froth on their lips, they rolled and tumbled, slashing and stabbing. Shem, seeking to catch Sula's wrist, was struck by the hurtling bodies and knocked violently aside. He lost his footing and sprawled against Cain's couch. And before he could move, the chained Englishman was on him like a great cat. At last, the moment he had waited for had come. Shem was within his reach. Even as Shem sought to rise, Cain's knee smote him in the breast, breaking his ribs, and Cain's iron fingers locked in his throat. Cain scarcely was aware of the terrible, wild beast struggles of the Elamite as he sought in vain to break that grasp. A red mist veiled the Englishman's sight, and through it he saw horror growing in Jim's inhuman eyes. Saw them distend and turn bloodshot, saw the mouth agape, and the tongue protrude as the shaven head was bent back at a horrible angle. Then Shem's neck snapped like a heavy branch, and the straining body went limp in Cain's hands. The Englishman snatched at the key in the dead man's girdle, and an instant later stood up free. Feeling a wild surge of exultation sweep over him as he flexed his unhampered limbs, he glanced about the chamber. Yaman was gurgling out his life on the tiles, and Sula and the other Elamite lay dead. Locked in each other's iron arms, literally slashed to pieces. Cain ran swiftly from the chamber. He had no plan except to escape from the temple he had grown to hate as a man hates hell. He ran down the winding galleries, meeting no one. Evidently, the servants of the temple had been massed on the walls, watching the battle. But on the lower tier, he came face to face with one of the temple guards. The man gaped at him. Stupidly, and Cain's fist crashed against his black bearded jowl, stretching him senseless. Cain snatched up his heavy javelin. A thought had come to him that perhaps the streets were practically deserted as the people watched the battle, and he could make his way across the city and scale the wall on the side next to the lake. He ran through the pillar-forested temple and out the mighty portal. He saw a scattering of people who shrieked and fled at the sight of the strange figure emerging from the grim temple. Cain hurried down the street in the direction of the opposite gate. He saw few people. Then, as he turned down a side street, thinking to take a shortcut, he heard a thunderous roar. Ahead of him, he saw four black slaves bearing a richly ornamented litter, such as nobles rode in. The occupant was a young girl whose jewel-bedecked garments showed her importance and wealth. And now around the corner came roaring a great tawny shape, a lion loose in the city streets. The blacks dropped the litter and fled, shrieking, while the people on the housetops screamed. The girl cried out once, scrambling up in the very path of the charging monster. She stood facing it, frozen with terror. Cain, at the first roar of the beast, had experienced a fierce satisfaction. So hateful had Nin become to him that the thought of a wild beast raging through its streets and devouring its cruel inhabitants had given the Puritan an indisputable satisfaction. But now, as he saw the pitiful figure of the girl facing the man-eater, 
he felt a pang of pity for her and acted. As the lion launched himself through the air, Kane hurled the javelin with all the power of his iron frame. Just behind the mighty shoulder it struck, transfixing the tawny body. A deafening roar burst from the beast, which spun sideways in mid-air as though it had encountered a solid wall, and instead of the rending claws, it was the heavy, shaggy shoulder that smote the frail figure of its victim, hurling her aside as the great beast crashed to the earth. Cain, forgetful of his own position, sprang forward and lifted the girl to ascertain if she were injured. This was easy, as her garments, like the garments of most of the Assyrian noble women, were so scanty as to consist more of ornaments than covering. Cain assured himself that she was only bruised and badly frightened. He helped her to her feet, and then was aware that a throng of curious people had surrounded him. He turned to press through them, and they made no effort to stop him, when suddenly a priest appeared and yelled something, pointing at him. The people instantly fell back, but half a dozen armored soldiers came forward, javelins ready. Cain faced them, red fury seething in his soul, ready to leap among them and do what damage he could with his naked hands before he died. When down the stones of the street sounded the tramp of marching men, and a company of soldiers swung into view, their spears red from the recent strife. The girl cried out and ran forward to fling her arms about the stalwart neck of the young officer in command, and there followed a rapid fire of conversation which Cain naturally could not understand. Then the officer spoke curtly to the guards, who drew back and advanced toward Cain. His empty hands outstretched, a smile on his lips. His manner was friendly in the extreme and the Englishman realized that he was trying to express gratitude for his rescue of the girl, who was no doubt either his sister or his sweetheart. The priest frothed and cursed, but the young noble answered him shortly, and made motions for Cain to accompany him. Then, as the Englishman hesitated, suspicious, he drew his own sword and extended it to Cain, hilt foremost. Cain took the weapon. It might have been the form of curtsy to have refused it, but Cain was unwilling to take chances, and he felt much more secure with a weapon in his hand. <laughs>